do you do? I seem to remember a song that was very popular some years ago called I'm a Dreamer, Aren't We All? It might well have been dedicated to the subject of this week's casebook history. There was a dreamer, if you like. Unfortunately, he couldn't distinguish between dreams and facts. He was a man who felt he deserved money, fame, and power, deserved them without the tiresome necessity of having to work and plan and save. As a child, he dreamed that as a man he would be rich and talked about. As a man, he dreamed that he was rich, and he certainly got himself talked about. For this, he was prepared to do anything, or anybody. A pretty loathsome character, you'd say. Well, see what you think. The place where we'll find him is a club, or at least it's called a club. One of the hundreds, possibly thousands of its kind all over London. Where you go down a few steps and up a few steps into a room with a bar. You pay a guinea a year for membership and they don't have any waiting list. And you don't have to be sponsored. In fact, all you need is a lot of money. There's always a radio and it's nearly always playing. Evening, Harry. Evening, Major Armstrong, as usual. Right. And keep your thumb out of the glass, you red-nosed robber. Now, now. Hello there. Hmm? Oh, hello, old boy. A bit of luck, this. I was hoping to run into you. You were, were you? Harry, make that two doubles. Very good, Major. Can't we go somewhere where I can buy you a drink? Oh, don't give it a thought. Besides, I'm meeting some people here later. Your drink, sir. Oh, thanks, Harry. Here you are. Sorry I haven't anything smaller. No, that's all right. I spent your change. Oh. You seem to be doing all right to yourself these days. Now I always did, old boy. No? Here's how. Cheers. You look like a man with a conversation on your mind. You catch on quick, and we better grab a table. This place will start filling up in a minute or two. Harry! A couple more large ones at the table in the corner. Right along, Major. Look, now that old goat Harry can't hear us, what do you call yourself these days? As it happens, I'm using the church name at the moment. All open and above board. Roy Carter. You funny, old-fashioned old thing. I know. Quaint, isn't it? And you? Jimmy Armstrong. Jimmy Armstrong. From South Africa. Got it. Good. Now, tell me, what's on your mind? That was a charming meeting between two old school friends, wasn't it? Yes, they did meet in a school, of a sort. But as I'm sure you've guessed, not the kind of an alma mater you refer to with real pride. No. Roy and uh, uh, Jimmy, as he calls himself, were both inmates of Boston. Perhaps you've heard of it. At any rate, it's an institution for juvenile criminals. But of course, it doesn't always work. Now and again, you get a bad hat who won't reform. Sometimes you get two. And you know what they say about birds of a feather. Oh, when I heard you were prosperous and doing the town in a large way, I said to myself, Roy, my lad, if that's so, you can bet your boots your old friend, uh, Jimmy. Thank you. <laughs> you can bet your boots he isn't treading the straight and narrow or any nonsense like that. Shows how wrong one can be, doesn't it? <laughs> it all depends what you mean. <laughs> well, I hardly expected to find you a bronzed warrior all covered in medals and glory. You're disappointed? From my own point of view, yes. You see, I'm suffering from a chronic shortage of cash. Oh, horrible situation for anyone to be in these days. You have my sympathy. Thank you. I don't suppose even a major's pay goes very far with the competition being what it is. A major's pay wouldn't last me a week. A couple of nights, more likely. Me gods. You mean you're working the old racket and you're in the army too? How do you get the time? The dear old army is not aware of I'm the fact I'm honoring it by wearing its uniform. You're playing it a bit steep, aren't you? Now, I always have, haven't I? That's so. But heaven help you if they shop you. You won't get out until you're old and grey, if then. Which is just one of several reasons why I'll make sure they don't get me. What a lad. How do you get away with it? I'll tell you in my memoir. Good old Nev. Oh, sorry, I mean Jimmy. Now, look here. Give me your address. I'll get in touch with you. You've got a job on a day after tomorrow. A Swagger West End house with a tidy collection of jewels in it. I know, because I went to dinner there last night. Will I fit in? My dear chap, you'll fit in beautifully. The jewels are locked up, but there's nothing you can't handle. In fact, it couldn't be better. You're on the road to riches. Come on, let's have another drink. Uh, thanks. I'll have to be shoving off now. Why, what's the rush? Well, you said you've got a date coming here. Oh, that's all right. Matter of fact, the dear thing doesn't know she's got a date with me yet. She thinks she's going off with another fellow who's supposed to meet us here later. But she's coming with me. Sounds complicated. It won't be. You'll see. You know, it must be nice. What nice? To be like you. I've heard a lot of rot about men who have power over women, but you're the only chap I've ever met who's really got it. Any woman, I mean. Remember that afternoon when we were in Brighton? Oh, spare my blushes and have another drink. Ah, now we have it. 
The one thing genuine about this phony is power over women. The girls, bless them, seem to have a way of falling for the worthless adventurer type. The girl he's been waiting for is coming into the club now. Let me describe her to you. She's not pretty. She's lovely. She's been an artist model, and just recently she started to break into pictures. The studio people have their eye on her, and well they might. Figure? Superb, of course. Clothes? Extravagantly simple and in perfect taste. Face? Ah, we haven't got time to go into raptures. But you will gather that she's a very tasty dish. She's seen her friend and she's going towards his table. Hello, Jimmy. Where's Rex? Oh, he rang up to say he might be a bit late. <laughs> You'd better have a good excuse. Marjorie, my love, let me introduce an old friend of mine. Roy Carter. Mrs. Marjorie Gardner, Roy Carter. Hello. How, how do you do? Yeah, it's a bit breathtaking, isn't she? <laughs> isn't he sweet? Now, just for that, you can have a drink. What'll it be? Something tall and cold and full of gin. Oh, have a care, hussy. That description fits the woman I love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jimmy, you're priceless. I love you. What, already? Oh, don't be so literal. In movie studio lingo, I love you means... It's a nice day. <laughs> I see. Then you're in films. Of course she is, old man. You think the movie directors are blind? Oh, stop teasing me, you boots, and someone get me a drink. Princess, to hear is to obey. Harry, I want a love filter and two scotches. <laughs> You're wondering whether this charming young grass widow, Mrs. Gardner, Marjorie, that is, knows that this new circle of acquaintances she's picked up, Jimmy among them, are crooks. Well, I'm afraid she does. Oh, yes, she's going into it with her lovely eyes wide open. She's quite sure she knows how to take care of herself. But we can't warn Marjorie of this. Besides, she wouldn't take any notice. She's having too good a time, and Jimmy is lazily, confidently exercising that dangerous charm of his. I say, Marjorie, do you really want to spend the evening with Rex? Obviously, Jimmy, dearest. Well, why should I be here? I just thought I'd ask, because as a matter of fact, I had other plans. Oh? I'm flattered. It's my fault Rex is late. I asked him to do something for me on his way down here. Oh, I see. I don't think you do. I wanted a chance to skip off with you myself before he arrived. I should be very angry. Are you? No. Now I suppose your friend Mr. Carter's shocked. Oh, don't mind me. I'm shockproof. Carry on. This is interesting. Well, Rex has kept me waiting. You wouldn't do that, would you, Jimmy? I never try and predict what I'd do. Why should I? The point is, how about it? How about what? Oh, don't stall, darling. Say the word and I leave a message for Rex to meet us at the Lamplighters Club. And then we just won't turn up. It's a bit rough on Rex, isn't it? But we can have a lot of fun. Mm. After all, Rex did keep me waiting. And that's that. Major Jimmy Armstrong, as he calls himself, has made another conquest. Uh, what sort of picture have you formed of this man so far? Worthless? A vain imposter? No more than that? But wait. Wait. All this happened on a Thursday night, sometime we don't know when, either that night or early the next morning. When we again pick up the trail of this man, he's at a railway station. But this time, he's in Royal Air Force uniform. And he's promoted himself again. He's a group captain. No less. Watch him. He's booking a ticket to, uh, to Southampton. Yes, he's perfectly calm and hurried. Apparently, he hasn't a care in the world. Gives a lavish tip and a smile to the porter carrying his suitcase and swings onto the train. At 2 p.m. on Friday afternoon, the horribly mutilated body of Marjorie Gardner is found in a London hotel room. And Inspector Spooner of Scotland Yard is hot on the trail of Neville George Cleveley Heath. Alias Major Jimmy Armstrong, alias Squadron Leader Walker, alias Jimmy Dudley, known to the police, previous charges for breaking and entering, burglary, fraud and deception, impersonating an officer. And now he's wanted for murder. Neville George Cleveley Heath. That's his real name. Remember it? 
The case made a stir all over the world when it hit the headlines in June 1946. That's our suave, fascinating crook, Heath, one of the most brutal murderers of modern time. Heath is on the run. He knows the police will be after him. What is he thinking about while the train carries him southward, away from London, and the pitiful remains of the girl with whom he danced so lightheartedly the night before? What's going on in his mind? I can tell you. We know because he talked about it later. Almost casually, apparently without any feeling, he told his thoughts in all their brutal truth. What am I going to do? I'm really in the soup this time. How am I going to cover up? This is murder. They're sure to find the body soon. What am I going to do? Come on, come on. I've always managed to think my way out before. But this is a bad one. I'm clever enough. I can outthink them. I can get out of this, too, if I can get the right answer. No, Neville Heath, you can't talk your way out of murder. Nothing you've ever done before can match this. Oh, yes, we know all about your back history. How you were sent to Boston for breaking into your friend's home and robbing them. How you were released during the war to serve your country. How you masqueraded as an officer both in South Africa and in England. And how you were dismissed the service. How you preyed on women, made love to them, and borrowed their money. We know about the uh, sadistic streak in your nature. It's always been there. It even showed up in your childhood. But this time, you've gone too far. No, I can get out of this mess too. So I was drunk, and that won't do. I told them I had a blackout. I didn't know what I was doing. No, no. I've used that excuse too often before. They might not believe me this time. And they've got to believe me. How can I make it strong enough? How can I persuade them I was off my head at the time? Off my head. Yes. Yes, that's my defense. That's it. Out of my mind. Insane. I was insane at the time. I must have been. And I'll prove it to them. I'll do it again. No, no, you can't do that. It's horrible. Unspeakable. I'll do it. I'll find another girl. And I'll kill her, too. And when they see her body, they'll know only a madman could have done it. They'll know beyond any doubt that the man who killed her is insane. Forgery, fraud, and sponging on the admiration of women, Neville Heath had always had the things he wanted. All his life he'd gambled against the law. Now he's facing his biggest gamble of all. His own life is at stake. To save himself from hanging for murder, he must give convincing proof of his insanity. Well, at worst, this will mean only a few years at Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum. For well, naturally, after a time, he'll be able to convince the authorities he'd been cured and will be given his release. He's fooled people all over the world. Of course, he'll be able to fool the doctors at Broadmoor. But he must plan carefully. Very carefully. He is in Bournemouth now, and is registered at one of the best hotels at Group Captain Rupert Brook. And already, in a few days, he's been there, he's become known as a good RAF type and a pleasant companion. Doreen Marshall, a pretty girl of 21, thinks he's a... Fascinating. Yes, it hasn't taken long for Heath to make another conquest. Flattered by the marked attentions of this handsome young man, Doreen has been dining with Heath at his hotel. And Heath is turning on all his charm. See him there, bending confidentially towards Doreen, pleading with her to stay on just a little longer. But she isn't to be persuaded. Just one more drink, one for the road. <laughs> I think I've had enough, thanks. It has been fun, and I've enjoyed the evening tremendously. There's much to worry to be going home. You couldn't leave me all alone on such a lovely night. Please, I must be going. Will you have the porter call a taxi for me? Oh, no need for that. I'll take you back to your hotel myself. I'd much rather go by taxi if you don't mind. Smart girl, Doreen. Obviously, she doesn't trust our smooth-mannered group captain. How very wise of her. But Heath has laid his plans carefully. 
Time is growing short, and the police are likely to close in on him at any moment now. He can easily outthink this inexperienced young girl. So, as they go out into the hotel lobby, Heath speaks casually to the porter. Uh, by the way, Stevens, you can cancel that taxi from Miss Marshall. I'm going to make sure she gets safely home myself. Very good, sir. Oh, but I haven't changed my mind. Oh, come on, darling. The sea breeze will do us both a lot of good. Oh, very well. I'll be back in half an hour, Stevens. No, he'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs> All right, have it your own way, darling. You know best. But Neville Heath was not back in 15 minutes. As a matter of fact, nobody saw him come in that night. But when the porter brought up the papers at 8 o'clock in the morning, Heath was in his room asleep. Oh, we don't like you, sir. I know you like your papers first thing. Yeah. Oh, it's all right, Stevens. Any interesting news this morning? Oh, uh, just as depressing as usual, sir. Oh, that latest London murder. Have they caught the bloody yet? No, they're still looking for him, sir. Ah, nasty business that was. Hope they get him soon. Yes, sir. By the way, sir, I didn't see you come in last night. Oh, I didn't think you did. In fact, I took good care you shouldn't. I told you I'd fool you some night and get in without that eagle eye of yours spotting me. I'd like to know how you did it, sir. I locked the front door myself at 11.30. Well, I'll tell you sometime, perhaps, but not just yet. I might want to use that same method of entry again. Well, judging from your shoes, sir, last night you spent some time walking on the beach. Uh, what's that? Your shoes, sir. See, there's a ridge of sand right around them. Eh? Uh, no offense meant, I'm sure. Oh, oh, no, that's all right. Take them along and have them clean for me. That's a good job. Uh, yes, sir. Cool customer, isn't he? And in the same unflustered manner, he later answered the hotel manager's worried questions. The lady guest who was missing from one of the other hotels in Bournemouth, could it be the same young lady who had dined here with group Captain Brook the previous evening? Perhaps he'd be kind enough to telephone the police? Heath privately decided to let police come for him. They did, in short order. An urgent message from Detective George Souter of the Bournemouth Police came for Heath. Hello? Detective Souter speaking. Is that you, Souter? Yes. Well, this is Group Captain Brook here. I understand from the hotel manager that he wanted to talk to me. I'm on the seafront. Come down and see me. Well, as you seem to be on holiday, I suggest you come up and see me. Well... At the police station? Yes, naturally. Uh, I suppose I'll have to, if I can find the beastly place. I'll go along this afternoon. And so began the battle of wits between the police and Heath. Is Heath clever enough to get away with it? So you can see we're concerned about Miss Marshall's disappearance. Well, when she left after dinner, we walked along to the beach and chatted a while. Her hotel was close by, and she said she'd gone alone from there. So I said goodbye and left her. Had you arranged another meeting with her? No, as a matter of fact, I hadn't. Uh, there was a possibility of her returning to London within the next few days. I see. And uh, she was dressed in evening clothes, you say? Yes. A very charming young girl. I should be distressed to hear that anything serious had happened to her. Mm, quite. Uh, excuse me a moment. Uh, Detective Souter speaking. Uh, uh, hello, George. Uh, this is uh, Spooner in London. I'm in charge of the Marjorie Gardner murder, you know. Oh, yes. We're uh, on the lookout for a fellow called Neville Heath. Pretty certain he did the job. I might personally think he's on the south coast. Might even be in our neighborhood. Yes, that's a distinct possibility. Uh, you've got a copy of his picture that we've circulated to all stations, of course? Yes. Not a very good one, but we'll have to do. I think it's entirely adequate. Uh, this uh, group captain book you ran up about this morning. I'm wondering if there could be any connection. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, do you know his present whereabouts? Most certainly. And he couldn't be better. What? Oh, good thank heavens, man. Don't tell me you've actually got him at the station. <laughs> We're bosom friends at the moment. Oh, mean he's actually in the room with you? <laughs> yes, just as close as two peas in a pod. Well, he uh, hasn't brought on to our conversation, has he? Oh, no. No chance of that. Yeah, can you hold him there? I haven't got a charge of any kind that'll stick. Well, think fast. Keep him talking. Uh, take him out of tea. Do anything. I mean, hold on to that man until I get the bonus from London. I'm leaving at once. Quite sure. Uh, my apologies, sir. Oh, that's all right. I know they keep you police pretty busy with one thing and another. <laughs> I've been amusing myself looking at this picture here on your wall. Which one? Oh, yes. Uh, Neville Heath. Bad lot. Uh, wanted for murder. <laughs> it's an odd thing, you know. He, he rather resembles you. Yes, that's just what I was thinking myself. You wouldn't be Neville Heath, Mr. Well, I definitely not. Well, I must admit, we seem to look pretty much alike. <laughs> I say, you'd better give me a signed pass or something to prove I'm not the man you're after. Otherwise, I might find it a bit embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a good idea. First, uh, let's have some proof of your own identity. Well, I haven't any of my papers on me. But I can certainly tell you about myself. And to begin with, I'm stationed at Dolson Aerodrome in Leicester. And I was flying down and got stranded by a bad weather. 
And now a really difficult part of Detective Souter's task begins. Heath knows he must not appear too anxious to get away. Souter plays on this. Heath, an abnormal egotist, loves nothing better than to talk about himself. Souter plays on this too. For a solid hour, the two of them sit on the garden wall outside the police station, chatting about their war experiences. Then Heath rises to go. Souter stops him. It's tea time. He suggests Heath join him inside for tea. Who says the British habit of tea in the afternoon then produces? Another hour goes by. Again Heath makes a move. Again Souter stops him, playing for time. Always playing for those few extra minutes that will bring it nearer to the moment when Inspector Spooner, Blackwood from London, will arrive. Heath and the detective. Talking, talking, talking. Tell me, Brooke, what sort of plane were you flying when you were strapping the German staff cars? Both riders. They were armed with rockets. <clears throat> Heath, that's a bad slip. You are forgetting that Detective Souter was with the 11th Armored Division and knows a thing or two himself. And he knows the planes you were flying were not fitted with rockets. Listen, he's testing you again. Oh, you were in the cab rank? Yes, that's right. I was for a while, and then I went on to other things. That's torn it. Heath, as a group captain, certainly ought to know that bow fighters were not used in what was called a cab rank. That is, planes kept standing by ready for calls from armored divisions needing support. Souter knows this, and he's now convinced beyond the last shred of doubt that the man he's dealing with is Neb Heath. The scarf around Heath's neck has just slipped off, and as he picks it up, he sees the detective watching him intently. How do you get those scratches on your neck, group, Captain Brooke? No? Oh, that's nothing, just an irritation. Sunburn, I suppose. They look to me like the marks left by a girl's fingernails. Marks left by a girl struggling to free herself from a man like you. It isn't true. You're Neville Heath. Come on, you might as well admit it. I am not. I'm Rupert Brooke. I've told you so. That suitor piles on the pressure now, causes bluff, rips his story to pieces and again identifies him. He sees that Heath has hypnotized himself with his orgy of lying, and Heath cracks. Oh, right, blast you. Yes, I am Neville Heath, and much good may it do you. to the police, Heath denied having killed Marjorie Gardner and insisted that as far as he knew, Doreen Marshall was still alive. But in the pockets of his sports jacket were found three vital pieces of evidence. A single pearl, later proved to be one from the necklace Doreen Marshall was wearing the night Heath murdered her. The return half of a first-class train ticket between London and Bournemouth later proved to belong to Doreen Marshall. The third item, a ticket for a suitcase left at the railway luggage office at Bournemouth. This case contained the whip Heath had used in his savage killing of Marjorie Gardner. Later, much more evidence was found that definitely linked Neville Heath with both murders. Heath was charged with the murder of Marjorie Gardner and sent to Brixton Prison. It was several days later before the corpse of poor little Doreen Marshall was found hidden away in a lonely gully near the beach at Bournemouth. The police... Hardened by experience, the ghastly sights had to turn their heads away from the terrible injuries to the body. Injuries which could only have been inflicted by, oh, not a madman, but a devil. Uh, Would you think it strange when I tell you that Heath's friends rallied to his assistance? Oh, yes, he still had friends left who believed him human. They thought he was a schizophrenic, a Jekyll and Hyde personality, only half responsible for his acts. During his trial at the Old Bailey, Heath's legal advisers admitted he had killed both Marjorie Gardner and Doreen Marshall. The gentlemen of the jury, in admitting that, does it not prove this man is not an ordinary sadist, an ordinary dishonest man, but mad as a hatter, absolutely insane, a maniac? Can he have been anything else? Was he? Let me tell you what happened when he saw in a newspaper a reconstruction of the way he is supposed to got back into his hotel room that night after his second revolting murder. This isn't how it happened. I want my lawyers called here, and I'll tell them how I really did get back. That ladder was on the left-hand side of the window, not on the right. I insist on seeing my lawyers immediately. Oh, do you, Neville Heath? 
What for? Aren't you forgetting you're a schizophrenic? Aren't you forgetting this whole affair was a complete blackout to you? How could you possibly remember which side the ladder was on? Or is it all still a very clear picture in your mind? A jury of his fellow men answered for him. Guilty. So Neville George Cleveley Heath paid for his crime. And on the morning of Wednesday, the 16th of October, was hanged at Pentonville Prison. A grim tale of a twisted life. And a man of many gifts who couldn't use them. And even grimmer is this footnote, but I think it has its bit of humor, too. A foreign journalist, tough, hardened by years of crime reporting, paid a visit to Scotland Yard's Black Museum. He asked to see the photographs of Heath's victims. Somewhat dubiously, the inspector unlocked the drawer and produced the pictures. The journalist took one look, shuddered, and collapsed against the nearest showcase. There was a loud clatter of broken glass. The hard-boiled journalist had fainted. <laughs> 